Hello, Christy. Everyone, welcome Christy Harvey to the Low Country Book Club. I'm just so pleased to have her. I know you guys are too. Um, I just want to give a brief intro in case anyone is not familiar with Christy. Um, Christy Woodson Harvey is the New York Times USA Today and Publishers Weekly bestselling author of nine novels, including Under the Southern Sky, the Peachtree Bluff series, and The Wedding Veil. Her Peachtree Bluff series is currently in development with NBC with Christy as co-writer and co-executive producer. Yay! She is the winner of the Lucy Bramlett Patterson Award for Excellence in Creative Writing, a finalist for the Southern Book Prize, and her books have received numerous accolades. She lives in North Carolina with her husband and 10-year-old son, where she is working on her next novel, or at least she will be when she finishes book tour. <laughs> exactly. You know. uh, before we dive into The Wedding Veil, your most recent book is your ninth novel. Wow. I, I don't know how that happened. It's like I turned around and there are nine of them. Yeah, That's amazing. It's it's crazy. Time just flies. It's unbelievable. It, it seems like last week I met you for the first time at SEBA in Raleigh. And you now it seems like you were this overnight smashing success. But I know you've been really hard at work <laughs> at this for a while now. So tell us a bit about your writing journey before we dive into the wedding veil. Tell us a bit about how you got here. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you, Susan, for having me. I know I've told you this before, but I don't know if I've ever told your group members before that I think you have one of the absolute most wonderful groups on the internet. I just, I love your members. They're so kind. You in particular, and also your group members have just been so supportive of me for so long. And I am so grateful. So anytime, you know, I see something pop up in the Low Country Book Club, I'm like, yes, this is so exciting. So thank you for having me and for taking the time to interview me tonight. And I'm just thrilled. So thank you. We're we are thrilled to have you and I always love to have you in the group. And I know everyone just really appreciates it so much. You're so responsive. You pop in, you say hi, you, you know, you, you answer questions, you, you thank people when they mention your books and you're just so gracious and we really appreciate you oh, all the time. So. I love it. So, um, but yeah, so my writing, um, Gosh, I know it feels it's so funny because it feels like it was yesterday. And also I like can't remember a time when I wasn't doing this. So it's it's both of those things. But um, my first book, Dear Carolina, came out in 2015. So I have been at this for just a little while. Um, but I have a background in journalism. I went to journalism school and always wanted to tell real people's stories. I never thought I would write a novel. I just couldn't really imagine that being something that I would do. But um Gosh, probably around 2012, I just got this story idea and it would not let me go. And I just thought, I'm going to sit down and write it. Or I'm going to try to, you know, because I don't know if you felt like this, Susan, but you don't know you can sit down and write a novel until you sit down and write a novel, right? Yeah, I mean, you don't know. Exactly. It's like, I hope I can, but I don't really know. I have a story idea, but that's not necessarily writing a book. So I sat down and I started writing and I just completely fell in love with the process. And somewhere in there, I just got very convicted, like, okay this is something I'm going to do. You know, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to go for it. And even if I don't make it, even if I don't get published, even if it doesn't work out, I'm going to try. Um, and so I signed with a literary agent in maybe like 2013, I think. And then um, I, he was shopping another manuscript I had written and I finished a manuscript called Dear Carolina. And I won a writing contest and there was an editor at in that writing contest, an editor at Penguin Random House was a judge in that contest. And she bought my first book out of that contest, which was oh. so bizarre, <laughs> but also really exciting. And even then, you know, I thought, okay, I'm getting a book published. Like I've done it. Check. I'm so excited. But by the time Dear Carolina was, um, you know, had been really purchased and that contract went through and all of that, I had finished a second book called Lies and Other Acts of Love. And at that point, I was like, I don't want this to end. You know, I wanted to keep going. So I've, you know, was very fortunate to get another contract. And, um, and here I am, number nine. Wow, nice. that's amazing. So you were in your background was in journalism before that. That's what you studied in school. And uh, but but did someone inspire you to write or to go into journalism or or to to make your living with words at an early age? Or have you always just loved writing? You know, whether it was journalism or or you know nonfiction or novels, have you always just had that writing bug? Yeah, I've definitely sort of always had the writing bug. I've always really enjoyed it. But you know, I had a lot of really good teachers, especially in high school, who really, you know, inspired me in that direction. Not necessarily to say, oh, you should write a book, but just to say, like, this is something that you're good at. You know, this is something that you should pursue. 
And I got um, an internship. Well, I was the editor of my high school newspaper um, when I was a senior in high school. And so Mm -hmm. part of that was you did an internship at the local newspaper. And um, I just wrote some pieces for them. And they actually gave me a column in the newspaper. And it was so fun because I got to you know, just write about whatever I wanted to. And I was 17 and um, I like all of a sudden had this platform to use my voice. And I grew up in a small town and um, they've always <laughs> just been really supportive of me. They've always really just, you know, we grew up in the same small town, basically. We have to tell that. Back okay. Up. All right. So, so Christy grew up in, in Salisbury, which is in Rowan County. And I grew up, Salisbury is a small town, but I grew up in the much smaller town, four miles down the road of Faith, North Carolina. So we, we practically were neighbors, but never, our, our paths never crossed. Well, okay. Um, <clears throat> I was in school a year or two before Christy. <laughs> And in a different high school, okay, maybe a decade or two before. (laughs) Anyway, um, there was a time gap there, so so our paths didn't really cross. But um, but until a long time later, but now it's it's really interesting because we have the same sort of uh, frame of reference. We know a lot of the same places, and and so where Christy interned the Salisbury Post is, is the paper I grew up reading. And, you know, that was, that was the paper your picture was in. If you, I I don't know, did something good in school or whatever, your picture was in the Salisbury Post. And so uh, it's, it's exciting to see somebody, you know, who has that same background, just um, all over the place now. So it's just, it's so fun. Like just that we, I mean, it's such a small world. You just, it's such a small world. You never know what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, that really was like a formative experience for me, for sure. And it, it led me to go to journalism school, which was not my plan at all. Um, and so I really think that was kind of the beginning. You know, I, mm-hmm. I went to journalism school and I loved writing. It was not um, what I ended up actually doing. After I got out of school, I was doing something completely different. I was working in finance when I decided to start writing my first novel. But um, but I think just having that foundation of knowing, mm-hmm. you know, sort of how to find your voice and how to use it and and, and what it felt like for people to respond to your writing, I think, you know, that's something that I never really, I took that for granted because it was just something that I had and, you know, had was given this platform to be able to do. So um, it, it, there's something really exciting about that, you know, to put something yeah. out in the world and have people give you feedback on it and tell you what they think. And sometimes even if it's not, sometimes even if they don't agree with you, it's still fun to like be able to have that discourse. So um yeah, it was very formative for me, for sure. Okay, so the first several books were contemporary, and The Wedding Veil has parallel stories, one contemporary, one historical. Did you set out to dive into historical fiction, or did this happen organically because of the story idea? Well, so it happened like in little bits and pieces. Um, I, I love historical fiction. I've always loved it. Besides contemporary, it's like one of my favorite genres to read, for sure. And so I knew I had a couple of stories just like in the back of my mind for like maybe one day that I would love to write that are in the historical fiction genre. And my agent knew that also. So I pitched her the idea for this for the for a novel called The Wedding Veil. And I wanted to write about a, a historical not historical. I wanted to write about a wedding veil and all the women who had worn it. And so, of course, you know, there probably would have been there would have been women from many generations, but it would not have been historical, you know, per right. se. Um, and so um, my agent actually said to me, you know, you've kind of been thinking about dabbling in historical fiction. What if you write about a real wedding veil? And I just was like, mm, I already have the idea for my book. I don't really think so. But so a few years earlier, um, we had been at Biltmore and I had just been really interested in Edith Vanderbilt. And I went home, I read a lot about her. I had all these questions about her that I couldn't really like easily find answers to. And I kept saying, someone should write a book about her. Someone should write a book about her. And so when my agent said that, it just put this little bug in my ear. And a few days later, I thought, I'm just going to do a quick Google search and just see if she happened to have an interesting wedding veil. And the story popped up about a veil that was made of Edith's grandmother's lace and worn by her mother and her three sisters and herself and her daughter, Cornelia, and then disappeared. And I just thought, that's the perfect historical contemporary novel. I can write about these two women in the past, Edith and Cornelia Vanderbilt, who I'm really interested in. And then in the present, we can solve this mystery of what happened. Not not Mm. a super boyer mystery, nothing that (laughs) deeply exciting but a little baby mystery of what happened to the wedding veil. So um, it just, 
you know, I felt like in some ways the story was kind of like handed to me, but um, I don't know if you ever feel like this, but oh yeah, it was definitely it came to me in like little bits and pieces. Mm-hmm. It was not one of those that I just sat down and was like, this is the book. It was like there were, I could look back and look at all these things that had happened over the last few years that kind of made it like, okay, this is going in the story and this is going in the story. So I really didn't even set out. It wasn't like I was like, I'm going to make this switch. And and I even, you know, I had to have a talk with my publisher. Like I want to do this story, but I really love writing contemporary fiction. So I'm not making a switch. I just kind of want to throw this in there. And they were like, okay, <laughs> which was nice because I thought they were, they might be like, no. <laughs> so it worked out, but it was fun to write. It was, it was something very different and um, a lot of research, obviously, but yeah. it was really good. It was, it was a good. So you, you told us sort of um, part of the story, but I love the anecdote that you share in the back of the wedding veil and the notes uh, about how the story idea came to you and, and actually where you were when the story idea came to you. And that sort of ties into, um, you know, your family history too. So would you like to touch on that for a yeah. minute? Absolutely. Um, so my husband's family has this really beautiful heirloom wedding veil that a lot of women in his family have worn. And so when we got engaged, his sister-in-law um, gave it to me and just said, you know, no pressure, but if you want to wear this, we would love it. And I just thought it was beautiful for one thing. And I mm-hmm. could not have found a more beautiful veil, but it also just felt really special because I thought, you know, this is, it kind of ties like my family and his family together in some way. And it just made me feel sort of like a part of his family in a larger way on our wedding day. And so I thought that was really special. And we had just talked about it and um, we have all sons for one thing, but we were like, (laughs) we should, you know, we should share this veil. It's beautiful. And um, if there's somebody that we really love and is really special to us, we should share the veil with them. And so my cousin Sydney was getting married and I was her matron of honor in her wedding. And of course, the first thing when she got engaged, I was like, you have to wear the wedding veil. You know, it's so pretty. <laughs> and, um, she was like, yes, I definitely want to. And then she found this beautiful dress and it just looked perfect with it. And um, so I was actually putting the veil on her head and we were the only two people left in the um, the bridal suite where she was getting married. And I said something like, isn't it crazy that this veil connects us to all these women that we'll never meet? Mm. And she was like, Oh, that is crazy. And then we were both like, that's a book. (laughs) And it was, you know, I, I laughed. I think I said, even then it's, it's been, it's like the joke in my family, like, don't say anything that you don't want in the next book (laughs) or, you know? Um, But I was like, I'm sorry, you know, it's your wedding day and we're still talking about the book. Like it's always (laughs) about the book. I mean, everything's material, you know? So, um, but yeah, so that was, that was really special because it was kind of this moment of like oh, this is a book, you know. Um, and I didn't know what the story would be about then, obviously. And and it was my agent who said, you know, hey, you should you should look at doing a historical wedding veil. So she was very helpful in that process. And um, yeah, just came together a little by little. That's amazing. So. Okay, so the contemporary part of the story, part of a set in the British Virgin Islands. I love that setting so much. I've actually been to the Soggy Dollar and to Foxes. Yes! Did you go there for research or did this come to you while you're on vacation? Okay, so this is really funny. So my husband and I went to the British Virgin Islands on our honeymoon and we had a boat and we not, not like Connor's boat. It was a nice boat. <laughs> but about for two people, not a massive yacht. So no one think that that's what we had our honeymoon on. Um, but we did do that trip around the British Virgin Islands and mm-hmm. you know, we did all the island hopping and we went everywhere and it was so fun. And so when our son was little, um, we went on a family trip to Bitter End Yacht Club, which mm-hmm. was then destroyed in a hurricane. Right. But we went um, like on a big family trip. It was Will's 40, it was my husband's 40th and my dad's 70th. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I was like, was he 70? Yeah, but yeah, so it was my dad's 70th. And, um, and our son was little, and we kind of wanted to do the boat again, but it just, he, I was like, he, he's not a good enough swimmer. Like, we just can't do that. So yeah. we had a really great time on the trip. And so we had scheduled a trip um, to go with another family on a boat trip um, for December of 2020. No. Oh. Yes, December of 2020, which obviously we could not go on. So my plan was I had started writing this book and I knew enough like from the two trips that I had been on that I could you know, start writing about it and I knew the places. And But I was like, this will be perfect because then we'll go on the trip and I'll really refine the storyline and make sure I've got all my places right and the map stuff and, you know, everything's like up to date. And 
But then of course I didn't get to go. So <laughs> that was kind of a bummer. Um, and we still haven't been back, but, um, but fortunately my husband had been many more times than I had and mm -hmm. remembered everything really well. So he helped me, you know, fact check and we definitely like double checked with BAPS and, you know, made sure that everything was kind of correct. So if there's a mistake, sorry, but, um, but my, yeah. husband, but my, no, I didn't mean to you. I just meant to the larger, yeah. Yeah. there's a mistake. We tried really hard. Um, but, um, <laughs> but my pub team worked really hard too on just like fact checking every little thing. And, um, but the resort, that so I actually set the contemporary story. We took the dates off, but my plan was to set it in 2016 because the resort where Julia is is kind of a fictionalization of the Bitter End Yacht Club, mm -hmm. which was destroyed in a hurricane, but has just reopened, which is really exciting. It took years and years. Um, and then um the fashionable romance exhibit that is actually in the book was is a real exhibit. And it did take place at Biltmore in 2016. So, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, all these beautiful places that you tied together, you know, in the British Virgin Islands and Biltmore House and all the, I mean, it's great. I mean, it's all these places that people want to go or maybe have been and can remember their, you know, happy visit or whatever. So that, it's that's really a COVID that. book. I was like, where do yeah. I want to go? That's where we're going to go in the story. <laughs> I don't blame you. So I love that this is Julia's story, but it's also Babs's story. I love that character, Babs. Um, um, was she suggested by someone you know? What was what was your inspiration for Babs? So I just love Babs. I really do. And she was actually going to be sort of, she was going to be always going to be a protagonist, but she was going to be a little bit of a smaller protagonist. And then as I was writing her, I just loved her so much that she ended up really taking over a lot more of the story. Um, but I mean, I wouldn't say she, I wouldn't say she was my grandmother necessarily, but definitely that relationship was inspired by my relationship with my grandmother. We've all, we were, have always been really, really close. And um, she just, you know, just, she was one of those people, and I say this about ba about Babs in the book, but she's one of those people that never made it seem like anything was kind of off the table just because you were getting older, you know, which I really mm -hmm. loved about her because I feel like sometimes people are like, oh, I can't do that, you know, or, you know, not at my age or, you know, whatever. And she just, that was just not her personality at all. And I think that's not Babs's either. So I really um, enjoyed writing that aspect of her and just writing that close grandmother, granddaughter relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so it was sort of inspired by that. I love the relationship, but I also love that attitude that you're talking about. It's like, you know, she's still fully living her life. You know, she's yeah. still looking forward, not looking back. And, and I love that. Um, OK, so in the historical sections, it felt to me like you worked hard to empathize with Cornelia Vanderbilt. Was she a difficult character to empathize with? To you really hit the <laughs> nail on the head with that. <laughs> Tell Susan Boyer is an author. <laughs> um, yes, she was difficult for me. She really was. I, um, she was another one. She was going to be, she was not going to be that big of a part. I had this sort of idea in my head of how this was really going to be Julia and Edith's story and Cornelia mm -hmm. and Babs were going to have these like little parts to play. And then both of them, you know, just as the story came together, they really fascinated me. And Cornelia in particular, she really, really fascinated me because I could not really understand why she made some of the decisions that she did. And I have to tell you that I did so much research on these women and I kept thinking, I'm going to find something like I will find something that is not public. I will interview someone that will say something or there will be something in her story that will make me understand her more. And I will say, I did find that a little bit. There was a family member that told me how incredibly stifled she felt by the press and how mm -hmm. um, she was just, just it sort of ruined her life. I mean, for all intents and purposes, and that she just really needed to escape. Um, right. She longed for anonymity because she was just so, you know, just covered in the press all the time. And it wasn't always positive. Um, and so that was something that was actually really helpful, but yeah, she was difficult for me to write about and sorry, this is kind of spoilerish. I don't know. Should we do, can we say We can do spoilers because it's the book of the month. So by the time people okay. watch this, they, they've okay. already read the book. Okay, and if good. They, have, oh, they know there can be spoilers. Okay. Okay, good. All right. Then I will say this. Um, but I, I had the hardest time with, you know, I felt like she just sort of, left her children, you know, and her whole life behind and all that. And that was hard for me. But I will say, you know, that was common for people of that era. You know, children did go to boarding school at very young ages. Um, so that 
that was not terribly uncommon. Um, but I, you know, I did have a hard time with some of her more eccentric behavior, especially toward the end. But I will say, um, one of the things that I found so interesting is, you know, I, I could read about all of this in newspapers. Like they, it was covered that, you know, she dyed her hair pink and she changed her name to Nielcha and she did all these things. And, but when I realized that she was really interested in numerology, um, that changed the story because yeah. I went and did a ton of research on numerology and all of the decisions that she made during that time were, could be directly tied to the study of numerology. So like her life path was 22. And if you were 22, your aura is pink and you like, there, <laughs> there's like, a, a you know, there were all these things that like were very specifically tied and made all of her behavior um, maybe not necessarily make sense to us, but they were explainable in some way. And so it was actually really helpful for me when I was writing her character to be like, okay, well, this is why she did this. And this is why she did that. And, um, and like the things, you know, that I said in the book about, you know, she was 34 in 1934 and that was her year of needing to find independence and that was real. Like that was directly, right. like I could go back in time and pull her numbers, um, you know, and, and be able to, to solve those types of equations. So that was, it was very, very, very cool um, to be able to do that. I got to tell you, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around the whole numerology thing, but I will say I, I felt I, I had some compassion for her myself in that I kind of felt like I could see her point in that, you know, this house was her, this huge, massive house that was, yes. was her responsibility. And it was kind of like a weight and she didn't want her children to have that weight and that responsibility. And I did, I did have compassion for that. I, I, I emphasize with that a good bit. Yeah, no, me too. And I, you know, and I, I also think that um, it's, she never asked for that. You know, she didn't ask to be born. Exactly. To be she didn't ask to have that huge house. And I do think that she felt that was a turning point, you know, for me in writing the story where you, know, you had sort of Edith who wants nothing more than to save this house and to save her husband's legacy. And then Cornelia who really wants nothing more than to run away from it. And I, right. I think we got, you know, when I got to that point in the story, it just, it started to make a lot of sense to me how, you know, you have these two people who are so close and then everything kind of starts to fracture because of this. And, and, you know, we've seen a lot of examples of things like this kind of becoming an albatross. Like it's something right. that seems like it should be so grand and glorious, but when you are the person day after day, that's responsible for it, it can feel like a huge burden. And, right. um, but, you know, I mean, ultimately it did stay in the family. It did live on for all of these generations. It is still a privately owned home. And um, it's, you know, arguably one of our nation's greatest treasures. So, you know, when you look at it that way, thank goodness Edith did what she did. and, and Oh, fought it's amazing. Today. Yeah. I love it. It's beautiful, especially in the springtime. You know, all the flowers and everything is gorgeous. I was there last week and um, oh. the tulips were all in bloom which was so crazy because I you know, write in the opening scene of the book they're at the conservatory and they're, mm -hmm. they're all the tulips are blooming and um, I did an event there for a company last week and it was over like kind of late and so I mean it's still it was still light outside but the property was closed but we were still like on the property mm -hmm. so oh it's like in there and there you know I could take all these pictures and there weren't people walking around and I was like this is crazy oh <laughs> this that's is amazing really cool. <laughs> that's amazing so how much of Cornelia's story was imagined and how much of that did you uncover in research? What, what are the parts you kind of had to imagine? Um, so I will say Cornelia, there's just not, there wasn't tons of information about her. Um, and she's mm -hmm. also someone who, you know, the more that I researched her, the more I felt like she was a person that um, had sort of been swept under the rug. You know, she, she didn't follow the plan and she was sort of swept under the rug and, um, you know, I, I wanted to uncover as much about her as I could. Um, pretty much everything in her story. I will say I could not find how she met John Cecil. Um, mm -hmm. So that is made up, you know, the the costume ball. and the, But it's still, I mean, it's made up, but it's based in fact. Like, I know they met right. in Washington, D.C., but I couldn't find anyone who knew actually, like, specifically how it was that they came to meet each other. Um, but I knew they met in Washington, D.C., um, costume parties like the one they went to were extremely common. 
um, and something that both Edith and Cornelia absolutely loved. And so I thought, well, that I didn't have an opportunity to put another costume party in there. And so I thought, oh, here's my opportunity. I can, you know, I can put them at a costume party. Um, so that specifically, you know, I did make up. But beyond that, a lot of it was true. She was a really talented artist. Um, she was a struggling writer um, who was trying to get published. I will say a lot of the Vanderbilt history, you know, you can find many different versions of it. And so I tried to be a little bit cryptic about it in the book, but um, I, I read different versions of, you know, the story that she was writing. Some, some accounts say it's a children's book and some accounts say it's a novel. Um, so for me, my purposes, it was, it was a novel. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm not positive that, that was true. It could have been a children's book, but I, you know, I found both. So I could believe that either one was true. Um, but I really, I mean, as much as possible, like I, I really did try to stick to the facts and, um, and use, you know, what I really knew about her. And, but even, gosh, like even at the end, like there were different accounts of, did she go to England? Did she go to Paris? Did she go to, um, and I, I do feel confident, like I did, a family member was able to say, no, she, you know, she went to England. And, um, and I do feel, so I feel confident in that, but I also loved just the symmetry of that, that John Cecil left his life behind for her. And, and then mm -hmm. that's where she ended up going. Like there was something really poetic in that to me. So I was kind of glad that ended up being the ending, but, um, but there, there were just so many things in their lives that I could find so many different accounts of. And so that was a little bit unsettling, you know, when you're trying to sort of stick to the facts. But um, I did, you know, meet someone from Biltmore who actually fact-checked the book for me, which was wonderful because there oh, were wow. so many little itty-bitty things that mm -hmm. I worried a lot about getting right. Um, but I'm trying to think of anything else big that I made up in Cornelia's story. I really just think it was how she met her husband. Okay. Her but, but the part about where she basically leaves and takes the veil with her and then gives it away on the train. Oh. I mean, that that's all made up. Yeah. Right? <laughs> anything about the veil, anything about the veil, I totally made up. Yes. The veil story totally made up. Yeah. I have no idea what happened to that veil. Yeah. Okay. Veil's gone. We don't know, but hopefully they'll find it. That'd be cool. So I've been a little bit piggish here and I've asked you all my questions and I've got some from other folks in the group that I need to, to okay. uh, ask. So um, Diana, McGoldrick would like to know if Christy could meet, talk to, or interview one of the Vanderbilt women in the book, which would it be and why? I just think it has to be Cornelia because Edith, I felt like, I feel like I know who she was. She was easy yeah. to piece back together. She was, um, she was very steadfast. She was very giving, um, very selfless. Like she just had a lot of these, these traits that were so evident through her history and through what was written about her and what she wrote about herself. And um, just she, I felt like, I felt like I knew her and even, even honestly, Cornelia, I mean, at the end, I sort of did feel like, but I still just feel like there's some things that we don't know. I, I don't, I don't believe that there, that someone who grew up loving a place so much wakes up one morning and leaves and never returns yeah. for no reason. I just don't believe that. Um, so I would love to know why I would love, so I would love to sit down with her and really know, you know, why what happened, she, what happened, <laughs> something happened. Yeah. So, uh, Marianne would like to know when you were researching the book, was it hard not to fall down the rabbit hole? Um, she says, I know I've become fascinated by a topic and can get lost. I saw in your author's note that there's a lot of conflicting information about the Vanderbilts that had to be frustrating. She spent a lot of time I, in the rabbit hole. <laughs> oh, the rabbit holes were vast. Um, yes. So many rabbit holes. My husband is actually in this hotel room with me and I just heard him laugh. <laughs> <laughs> um, to the point that I was like, oh, Edith Vanderbilt was really good friends with Edith Horton and like went back and read Edith Horton's novels because that was important <laughs> for the story. I mean, that's always a fun thing to do, but still like, come on. Um, yes. And, and, you know, like she, Edith Horton comes into play in this book for like three sentences. And I mean, I did, I could, I could do a presentation on her right now if I needed to. Um, but, um, and there were a couple of other things like, the, the biggest rabbit hole that made it into the book that I can actually think of was I did not, I couldn't find how Edith met, not met. I knew she had known Peter Gary, her second husband for a long mm -hmm. time, 
but I didn't know how they got back together, like how that actually happened. And again, it was something that no one really seemed to know. And so um, I spent an embarrassingly long amount of time trying to figure out exactly when they would have gotten back together, which was actually kind of easy because um, I knew when his ex-wife got remarried. And so it was right after that. And so I sort of drilled down on this time period and tried to figure out, okay, what is an event that they likely both would have been at? And um, there was this big Helen Keller speech in Washington, D.C. that kind of everyone who was anyone was there. And it was um, in support of a cause that Edith was really passionate about. And I was like, to be sure she was there. And then, you know, I was going in and trying to find like, what would she have worn? And what, I mean, I cannot tell you how much time I spent recreating that scene. And it was made up, but I was trying to make it as factual as I possibly could. And so many rabbit holes. So many. <laughs> so many. That's, that sounds like me. I've been down a few rabbit holes. Um, yeah, you know. it's, it's, you, if you're interested in what you're researching, it's hard to, to not do that, you know. It is. It. And you, even though you know, like, I'm not going to use all of this, it's still nice to know what's informing your story. Right. So I feel like the more nothing's lost, you know, nothing's wasted. Yeah. The more you know and the more authentic your story is. It makes your story richer, I think. Yeah. So Pat Tarter says, I love the book and I love Biltmore. Your book makes me want to return because I'll see it through different eyes this time. Did you find it a bit sad that Cornelia never seemed to be truly happy and was always searching for her true passion? Oh, I found it terribly sad. I found it terribly sad. Um but also kind of a lesson, you know, we hear it so much, but you, you can have all the things in the world and it, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're going to be happy. And I think she was right. such an example of that, that all the things that she had didn't feel like a privilege to her. They felt like a burden. And, right. um, and I think that happens to people. And I think it's hard to understand because so many times we think, well, this would make us happier. This would solve our problem. And then, you know, we look at someone that seems to have all of those things that isn't happy. And it's like, how could they not be happy? But, um, you know, she still had all of her own problems. And but yeah, it made me really sad. I think it was a really sad life. I like to think that, you know, you know, I, and, and I think that's, I think as a child, she was very happy. And I think there were times as an adult, she was happy. And I, I do think that she found a place um, for herself, you know, after she left, I think she had um, some happy relationships and um, really enjoyed her life. She was very philanthropic later in her life. So I, I like to think that she did find her happiness. I hope she did. But yeah, it was sad to write that for sure. Eileen asked, does Christy think Cornelia ever changed and wanted to come back to her family? Well, I, I know based she on never, your research. Yeah, I mean, I know she never returned to Billmore. Yeah. Um, but she did. It, it wasn't like she never saw her family again. I mean, she saw her children and, you know, they lived with her at different points. And it wasn't like she dropped them off and never saw them and walked away forever. Um, so she did see her children. I don't, you know, I, I get I get the feeling just from, you know, people that I talk to you know, in her family that she did not have a close relationship with them as adults, um, which I think is sad, but also, you know, that's none of my business. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, you know, you, you, it, it, you, you read the book. I mean, it's understandable too. You know, not everyone's going to sympathize with the decisions that she made. And that's very understandable. There are a lot of sides to that story. So, um, yeah, so I, I think that is sad, but, um, I do think, you know, it wasn't like she never saw her family again, but I, right. but she did not go back to Biltmore, which is really amazing to me. So I'm kind of embarrassed that I did not think to ask this question, but Kathy Besaw wants to know, does anyone know what actually happened to the Vanderbilt wedding bell or has it been lost to history? So as of now, it has been lost to history. It was very carefully recreated in that um, fashionable romance exhibit that I mentioned. Um, and there is hope because this is so crazy. While I was researching this book, someone from Biltmore called me to tell me that they had found Edith Vanderbilt's wedding gown. Um, wow. Not at Biltmore. It was found off property and it was, um, and the person that found it didn't know what it was. They just, it was like a happy coincidence that, huh. um, you know, they just said, I found this. It could be important. Will you check it out? And it happened to be Edith's wedding gown. Wow. So, um, yeah, so there's hope, you know, it, it can still be found and I we might know. know what happened to it yet. Yeah. yeah. 
All right. So Kim Gaffney would like to know, she says, Hayes moving in with the other woman so quickly after the breakup was a sign that Julia made the right decision. Did you debate including that? So many times our decisions are not affirmed by that blatant of a sign. Um, I just feel like that was on brand for him. <laughs> yeah. I thought so too. <laughs> um, and you know, yes, that's so true. In real life, so often our decisions are not affirmed, but I felt like I just wanted that for Julia. Like I wanted her yeah. to have that real, like, oh, well, I definitely did the right thing there. Um, and and I think too that sometimes when we're in those situations where I think sometimes people can make you know make us feel like we're crazy. And I think he made her feel right. like she was crazy. We didn't see that part of their lives too much, but I think she sort of touches on that. That there were many times uh, through the years that she just had that little like mm, something's not right here, and he was like, "Why do you act like this?" And then right. she was right. He was, yeah. kind of, he was kind um, of gaslighting her, and I'm glad that we saw yes. him. You know, her yes. her she was vindicated in in her yeah. feelings, and and I like that. Yeah. That was very satisfying for the reader. I think <laughs> from from I the, this group, for this reader, it was satisfying for the writer also. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so Pamela Ashmore would like to know, will there be a sequel? I want to know what happened to Julia. That's so nice. Um, I don't know, but you haven't asked that a lot. I, when I originally pitched this story, I thought it was going to be The Wedding Veil and The Wedding Pearls, but that was when it was going to be contemporary. So I don't know. There's a part of me that's like, well, I could do The Wedding Pearls and continue Julia and Connor's story, but also have like another historical little Touchstone in there. So I don't know how to exactly tie that together, but I think it could be kind of fun. Or maybe tell us some more about Babs. I think we, I, I mean, I would love to hear more of Babs' story. We need to know. Oh, Babs, for sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. So Rebecca Kendall says the story of the pink haired Russian woman who gave the gift of the veil was one of my favorite parts. How did you come up with that? Now I want to know everything about her. And th that actually, that, I mean, not the train, the scene on the train, but the the Russian pink hair. I mean, that's actually real, right? I mean, that's it's real. Yeah, it's real. So she, so Cornelia did dye her hair pink. Um, again, it was, it was numerology. I mean, it, that was the that was her color, and that that was like kind of common. It also, I will say this too. So there was that, but it was also very fashionable to dye her hair pink, which is something I learned in my research because, um, really? especially in France, like a lot of women dyed their hair pink. Yeah. Um, Cause I was trying to figure out, I wanted to see her dyeing her hair pink. So I did talk about a rabbit hole. I did so <laughs> much research on how women dyed their hair during that era and like how you would have dyed your hair pink, but I, I couldn't get enough information that I felt like I could like adequately portray her actually dyeing her hair pink so that we could see her doing it in the book. Um, but that was true. And she did change her name to Nielcha. So that was also true. So it, I took, you know, facts that I really knew about her and thought, how could this have, you know, turned into a story right. that could have been, that could have been, you know, how stories get very convoluted through the ages and the years. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was like, how could I take this story and make it something that had gotten really convoluted? Well, it was interesting. That part was very interesting, especially the pink hair. I couldn't believe that was real, but I, knew, I mean, I know it was, but it was like, Really? People yeah. then did that? I mean, I know now some people do, but then I, I did not realize that, that that was well, something. Really, that was there was another and, Vanderbilt that dyed her hair pink, too. Really? I oh, just well. stumbled upon that, you know. <laughs> Maybe her aura was pink as well. Her aura must have also been pink. I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what is next for you? What are you working on now? And will that be your next book to release? Or is there another in the pipeline? So my next book to release is called The Summer of Songbirds, and it is coming out April 25th, 2023. Um, I'm actually working on it right now. It's um, my first draft is finished and everything. I, have, I think I turned it in in two weeks. So I'm just like, and then wow. um, we're just, you know, finishing it up right now. So I'm, I'm excited about it. And it's, um, it's about these three best friends who meet at summer camp as children and have stayed friends through their adult lives. And one of them, one of their aunts actually owns the summer camp and because of, this is you know, several years past COVID summer, but because of that, you know, the camp has been sort of struggling financially ever since. And mm. she's faced with the decision of having to close it. And so these um, women are like aghast that their summer camp could be closing and they decide to get together and save summer camp. Um, 
but that's sort of like the periphery, like that's sort of like the story going on in the background. But um, there's, you know, they each have like sort of a major life situation that they're working through. Um, namely that um, Daphne, who's one of the protagonists, is an attorney and she finds out something about her best friend Lanier's fiance that is protected by attorney client privilege, but that Ooh. she really needs to know. So she has to make a decision about whether she's going to you know, tell her best friend, um, who's really more like a sister to her for reasons that you find out in the book. Um, if she's going to tell her and get disbarred um, or if she's going to let her marry this man, knowing what she knows about him. So, Wow. That's tough. So, okay. A moment ago, we had just a little bit of a of internet wobble. Tell me that release date oh, again. I didn't quite catch sorry. it. It's okay. I mean, it just... uh, hotel internet is not the best. Yeah. Um, it is April 25th, 2023. Okay. We will look forward to that. All right. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you think we should know? I think we covered it. And like, I got to tell a lot of stories that I don't think I've told anywhere else. So that is always, Wonderful. I always love that. I'm like, Oh, this is great. Like I said, like three things that I haven't said anywhere else. That makes me really excited. So that makes um, me happy too. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Okay, this is so great. Thank you for all the great questions. And thanks to all of the group out there for all of your great questions and for reading this book. And I'm so grateful to all of you for your support. I really am. We are so happy to have you. Thank you so much for making time to do this. I know you're super busy right now and we are thrilled to have you. And I can't wait to see your next book and read that when that comes out and um, see what you do next. And the, and the TV and the TV thing, the, the movie. Oh, so what, when is that going to be? Do you know? Do you have any dates I on that? I don't have any dates yet, unfortunately. Um, but it is. So the pilot is written. I, I got to write the pilot with the writing team, which wow. is really fun. Um, so that is finished. And we're just kind of at like a pause right now. So mm -hmm. um, we're just waiting to hear, you know, next thing. So it's like a hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I'm hoping to get more news soon, but I'm really excited about it. And, you know, I hope that it all works out and that we're watching it someday soon. It'll be really exciting. Wow. We'll, we'll have to have a watch party in the group or something. <laughs> <That'd be so laughs> that sounds great. Thank you so much. And have a great time with the rest of your book tour. It looks like you're having a lot of fun. It looks fabulous, all the, the things you're doing. And uh, we love watching the pictures and seeing everything online. So thanks for sharing. Thank you, Susan. Thanks again for having me. Thank you, Christy. Take care. Bye-bye.